Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, and it's time to cover some more episodes of an anime! And weirdly, it's not like JoJo or My Hero Academia or something, but a slightly lesser-known mecha anime. Slightly being the key phrase there, obviously I saw a lot of you talking about how excited you were to have me covering this one, but I had never heard of this or the Brave series as it's called. A franchise focusing around giant mecha suits punching each other while the series are named things like Brave Express Might Gain, Brave Fighter of Legend Dagarn, or Brave Fist Champion of Sprites. One of those I just made up. Those of you who have never heard of this series before, try to guess which one it was. No looking it up. Anime mecha shows can be roughly divided into two kinds of series. Real Robot, wherein the plot is fairly serious and the setting meant to be realistic. As realistic as you can be with giant robots anyway. Most Gundam series, Evangelion, that sort of thing. The Brave series, on the other hand, is the other type. Super Robot, where the show takes itself less seriously, the robots are more over the top, the characters are more exaggerated, and the mecha are really more like giant superheroes rather than weapons of war. Me personally, back when I was into anime as a teenager, I tended to prefer the former. Universal Century Gundam stuff in particular, though of course I am way out of touch with it now. Nowadays, I'm more into mainstream stuff, like comic books! Oh god, I've wasted my life. Anywho, interestingly, the Brave series actually connects to another topic of import to us around here. Transformers! After a decline in Transformers' popularity in Japan, Takara, the company behind Diaclone and Microman, which would become Transformers, made a deal with the animation studio Sunrise to develop a new franchise, that being the Brave series. Apparently, some of the designs from across the series were actually reused from some of the Transformers series they had worked on already. Man, I can't wait for someone to pilot Soundwave by flying a giant cassette into him. This is actually one of the rare instances where the patron wants me to do the dub instead of the original Japanese, which admittedly made things a little more difficult to work with because the dub's out of print and they only did up to episode 25 out of 49. Admittedly, I'm not watching the full series anyway. Sorry, I only have so much free time as it is, and I'm currently embroiled in a massive investigation into Chinese movies that rip off half a dozen Japanese ghost movies in the same vein as The Ring and The Grudge, and have them all fight each other. Yes, beyond the official fight that those two franchises had, it's a rabbit hole! Of particular note was that Veronica Taylor, the original voice of Ash from Pokemon, also voices the main character in this one, Mamoru. Or Darian, as he's known in the dub. Also, if you'll recall the Justice League Secret Origins review I did a few weeks ago, I slowed down the footage of the telepathic transmissions from the Martian Manhunter because it was a bit of flashing lights and color in it, and I'd rather not risk those sensitive to that getting seizures. That's what we YouTubers call poor audience retention. Gaugaigar has a lot of flashing lights in it as well. I will do my best to fix that in editing, but I apologize in advance if some of that slips through. Hopefully this warning is helpful to those of you out there who would be affected by this. So let's dig into the first four episodes of King of Braves Gaugaigar and see what a 90s super robot show looks like. with a familiar sight for me, driving in the snow. The couple in the car, the Amamis, spot a shooting star. Ah crap, this is where the aliens from the Justice League opener went after they failed to conquer Earth? I'm making a wish on that shooting star. 
and asking it to send us a child of our very own someday. She's gonna give birth to a giant robot, isn't she? However, it seems the shooting star was actually some kind of robot that almost crashes into them. They break hard and both fall out of the car. On the same side of said car. I guess in this world, seatbelt laws are pretty lax. It's an unorthodox way of doing Superman's origin, but I'm okay with it. It must be one of those North Pole lions. You an idiot. It seems I wasn't actually far off about the Superman comparison, because indeed, the robot lion has a baby in its mouth. It drops him off with the two and then flies off. And screw telling little kids they were delivered by storks, I'm gonna tell mine they were delivered by Voltron. The narrator says this was eight years ago. Who could have known that he would one day hold the key to life or death for all of mankind? I mean, I probably could have guessed that since dropping off space babies with random humans is not the kind of thing done for kids who don't have that sort of thing in their future. Although that would make for an interesting anime, just a slice of life kind of thing for someone who has absolutely nothing to do with the magical space destiny stuff happening all around them. Oh, and the kid's got a weird birthmark, it seems. Well, suddenly I have a refreshing mint flavor. This leads us into the theme song. Not much to say, lots of random images of spaceships flying, people in weird armor flying around, some cool animation, and a lot of the flashing images issue. The song itself isn't particularly good to me, kind of tuneless and unmemorable, aside from repeating ga 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 a lot. Appropriate with the baby we just met. This is the story of the brave men and women who fight to save the human race. That does not narrow down what story it is. We also get our episode title. Birth of the King of Braves. King of Braves. In the far off distant year of 2005, the world is overcrowded, tons of pollution, overdevelopment, etc. Kind of weird that it's only set eight years in the future from when it was produced, but they were already expecting things to get that bad in less than a decade. However, beneath the earth, some sort of evil is beginning to awaken and... Yeah, already I've got to basically just make this still images because it is flashing like crazy. The baby, now grown up as Mamaru Amami, say that three times fast, is with his class at Garbage Island to learn about how we're all screwed and we can't keep a pace with recycling anymore. So write some essays about it, third graders. Well, I see that the Tandy Computer Whiz Kids' recycling efforts were a dismal failure. And hey, another case of The Simpsons predicting the future. Where are we going? Garbage Island. Also, their teacher keeps attracting flies, yet they ignore the kids. What the hell soap does she use for that to happen? Although, considering the flies are staying perfectly stationary, maybe these are actually, like, futuristic tiny drones. Alright, try not to get hurt! You're on your own from here on out! I see in our old future, teachers don't care about getting sued anymore if they let their kids play in a landfill. Hey Timmy, I see some used needles over there! Let's play with them in the moldy puddles! Hey, they got one thing right about the future though. Kid playing on his Nintendo DS in his class in 2005. I can't believe someone would already toss a 2002 flat panel TV. Well, call me an empiricist, but I think it might have something to do with that huge obvious crack in the middle of it. Hey, cool! This portable mini disc player still works! The most popular medium among kids! Mini discs! After Mamaru laments that a perfectly good action figure was discarded for no good reason, I guess his spider sense goes off and travels into the entranceway deeper into the island, finding a wall of screens that, yet again, I have to still frame because of all the flashing lights. He flees the area when he notices a bunch of cables on the ground wriggling on their own. Out of the pile emerges a giant robot, which apparently reactivates not only the G on his forehead, but also the lion robot from eight years ago. The thing had been chained up somewhere, and it escapes its imprisonment. The people who were holding it refer to it as Galleon. Okay, now I'm just annoyed on principle. Shouldn't it be Galion? One of those people is this dude, Kotaro Taiga, who is also the president of the Space Development Corporation and has a secret desk elevator that brings him down to the group, labeled as the Gutsy Geoid Guard, or as they're colloquially known, Grrr. Apparently it's like a bat pole since it allows him to change clothes, including into this spiffy cape. The narrator explains that the Guard are a world defense force, their headquarters located at the bottom of the ocean. No doubt in case Cthulhu rises again. Holy crap, why have we not had Lovecraftian monsters versus giant robots yet? 
But just what is the 3G organization, and why are they armed with the mysterious mecha lion named Galleon? Well, you're the narrator, shouldn't you know? They're confused about what could have awakened Galleon until one of their agents shows them the giant robot on Garbage Island. With Mamoru in danger back on the island, Galleon starts trying to attack the gate to be let out, so they decide to let it loose, launching it out of its own little ship. Gonna be really awkward if it turns out it just needed to go to the bathroom. Back with Mamoru and the other kids, he spots one girl, Hana, has been thrown over the edge of their boat and now risks falling. But he and a bunch of other kids form a chain to reach down and grab her. Oh, but we also learn that they are not just in their boat, but rather on top of the giant robot's ass. Okay, more like tail position, but that's not as funny as saying they're on the robot's butt. Only those five kids are still on the boat, the rest having been thrown clear. The Japanese defense forces scramble some fighters to intercept the thing, but as with any kaiju movie, you can tell how well that goes for them. A neat trick is that the robot has apparently taken discarded microwaves and combined them into a weapon. Deadly, yes, but I do see there being a practical purpose for such a weapon. The robot approaches the capital city, but fortunately Galleon arrives to fight, which allows the robot to reveal its other weapon, a bunch of freezers that act as a freezing ray. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! I am 99% certain that is not how freezers work, but okay, let's go with that. To make things worse, turns out one of the kids is actually the brother of one of the people working at 3G, and the robot has some kind of energy shield that blocks attacks. President Taiga says there's only one person who can break in and rescue the kids. No, they're sending in this guy, Guy Shishio, and his magnificent hair who just happened to be standing nearby at the time, I guess. And hey, he's got all that armor on him to protect him. Probably needs a helmet, though. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. He's able to get in and reassure the kids, but it seems the robot's internal dimensions are shifting a bit. The garbage is pushing the kids out and even shoves Guy into the water. It can also transform in general, changing into a train mode that, of course, is perfect when going into Japan. From now on, that entity shall be referred to as EIO2. Ah, so this is gonna be a Monster of the Week sort of anime, where the designations eventually reach EIEIO. Fortunately, Guy is outfitted with multiple vehicles for these sort of situations, including a frickin' bullet train! Unfortunately, he can't just check into it like it was a chariot race or something, so Taiga authorizes fusion, which I think we can all guess where that's going. That's right, Taiga and Guy doing the fusion dance. The robot reaches its destination, City Hall, and returns to biped mode to attack it, but Guy and Galleon are waiting. Fusion, it seems, is not really all these vehicles we've seen making a Megazord, but rather Guy and Galleon fusing to give it a humanoid form, now known as Gygar. I suppose being a fusion is the reason why Gygar's mouth moves when he talks and it's not just like, piloting it or something, but whatever. They rescue the kids and just put the boat remains on top of a building. The robot attacks him again, and he wants authorization for final fusion, though the odds of it succeeding are slim. Success rates are nothing but scientific theory. A brave heart will defy any odds. Oh, is that so then, hmm? Well, why don't we just start chucking those children off the rooftop then, eh? Sure, their chances of survival are low, but a brave heart defies any odds, am I right? However, this is an anime, where that's entirely accurate. Program drive engaged! And now I have broken my hand! Final Fusion, of course, brings us our Megazord combination, mostly thanks to the power of Listerines swirling around them. And this is, of course, the titular Gao Gygar, and it's a pretty spiffy design, though the stealth bomber wings seem a bit bulky compared to everything else, in my opinion. Gao Gygar has some pretty impressive weapons, too. Its own shield system that somehow transforms the microwave and ice beams into star-shaped energy and reflects it back. Plus, of course, a rocket-powered fist that punches a hole in its head. Unfortunately, as we've seen, this thing likes to morph itself using the garbage, so it reforms the head quickly. Only to be punched again. Fortunately, the finisher move does it, allowing Gao Gygar to grab the energy core of the thing and rip it out. But when he tries to crush it, Mamoru instinctively knows they shouldn't, and leaps at them! Off the roof! While sprouting wings! 
Okay, to be fair, my assertion was people chucking them off of the roof, not them leaping off of their own accord. So, I, I think I'm still in the clear here. Who in the world is that boy? Well, based on the ending credits, he's apparently Pit from Kid Icarus. But yeah, that ends the first episode. Ending music itself is fine, nothing to write home about. While I've got a moment, I do want to talk about something annoying about this DVD that I've come across in others as well. So all my physical media, DVDs and all, I rip to have a digital copy. Power Rangers, movies, other TV shows, etc. It's just more convenient to have digital files, since chances are I'll be using them in a video at some point anyway. With most DVDs, the movies or episodes of a show are their own individual files on it that the disc is accessing when it plays. But for some reason, a lot of anime DVDs have all the episodes as one file. And I don't mean, well, they have a big file combining them all and the individual episodes too, as an option if you just want to play all. I run into that sometimes too. I mean, this DVD has five episodes on it, but they're all one huge file. If you want to play individual episodes, it's just going to a specific spot in that two-hour file. It's not really a problem or anything, it's just... weird. And I only encounter this with anime DVDs. Why is that? Episode 2 starts things off with a flashback to Guy's early days as an astronaut, when a huge alien ship sideswiped his shuttle. <laughs> uh, on your right! After Guy was rescued by Galleon, the narrator explains that the ship was EI-01, aka Extra Intelligence Classification Number 1. And to ensure his survival, he was rebuilt by a team of experts. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to build the world's first bionic anime character. What about Ghost in the Shell? Shut up! Given Steve Austin was an astronaut too, wouldn't surprise me if the show did draw inspiration from the six million dollar man for that. Anyway, let's properly continue episode two, The Boy with Green Hair. So, like, season zero Seto Kaiba? I mean, we already do have the dub voices for Yugi and Joey in this. Mamoru transforms the energy core briefly into some kind of weird form before then reverting to a homeless guy who is, of course, very confused and horrified by all this. With his job done, I guess Mamoru's home planet needs him, since he just flies off outside their ability to track him. After Gao Gai Gar heads back to base, Mamoru apparently arrives back home, and wow, I just realized how much gel is in this kid's hair. Like, did he get out of bed and decide to do that to it? But yeah, his parents are just happy he's okay. The AAMV has just retrieved Gao Geiger and is preparing to redock with the 3G Bay Tower base station. Look, I know the giant robot action is over, but I don't think people's attention spans are so bad that you need to describe everything that's going on in front of us. We get a sequence showing not only Gao Gai Gar being cleaned, but the disassembly process, which takes a lot more effort than it takes to put it together. It's also evident that this whole ultimate fusion thing hasn't been perfected yet. Guy himself is severely worn out and having trouble focusing. Plus, an examination of the bullet train segments shows severe stress and damage just from the transformation process itself not from the battle. It's a neat touch, not normally necessary for a super robot show, but it does add a little tinge of realism in a series like this. Back in the land of too many damn strobe lights, the villainous face, identified as Pasdar, summons the Machine World Four Heavenly Kings to advise him. In the tradition of Dragon Ball characters, these guys are all named after Italian food. Pasdar, of course for pasta, Polonaise, aka Bolognese, Primarda, presumably for Primavera, Vera, Pinchinone, I think for pancetta, and finally, pizza. That's a tough nut to crack, but I'm gonna guess that pizza is a reference to risotto. I am not kidding about the strobe lights. They're having a normal conversation about what happened, and the show refuses to not flash the lights. Just criminy, what was the creative inspiration here? Do they hate the audience being able to see what's happening? The gist of it is that they plan to use a different human for the core of their next robot that'll be more vicious than the hobo, and we see that it's probably this professional wrestler. Oh, and then there's the poor teacher whom reporters are ambushing. Look, big ants piss off! While the other kids discuss what happened, Mamoru is more confused with himself and how he was able to do what he did. 
And then there's just a weird sudden cut to them explaining who the hobo was. It'll be like if in the middle of me talking about this, we just cut to- And that is why, from the perspective of the contest of champions, no time has passed at all. Long story short, the homeless guy had his own company that went belly up when the government ended their contract with him and his family left him, which is probably why he went after City Hall. But those at 3G can't figure out how he got involved with EIO2. We've used hypnosis to try and trace his recent memories. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? He says machine people came to him and convinced him to be the core and that they'd help him get revenge. Also in his memory is a horse that he had gambled away his last money on and lost and that horse's head shaped the head of the giant robot. The host's own emotions and memories influenced the robots. Anyway, back to wrestling. And in the red corner, the reigning SMW champion, Death Bomber! Wow. Who could possibly face off against a guy like that? Uh, Death Bomber! Never has a name been more appropriate, cause Boom Button is here to ensure that you bomb tonight! And hey, say hi to death for me! After all, I sent him so many new clients! Ooh! Ah. When it looks like he might lose, Panchanon shows up to creepily offer him some more power. Somehow, that causes Mamoru to go Super Saiyan Blue, or green, I guess. But yeah, the wrestler has been transformed and makes his opponent flee in terror. Ah, don't worry, he'll be back next week with the Money in the Bank contract. He starts absorbing nearby construction equipment and other stuff to form into a giant robot and starts smashing up buildings. Guy soon awakens. Don't worry, Makoto. Cyborgs heal quickly. That is logic. In what he says. Guy arrives on the scene and uses his Galleon signal to summon the robot and fuse into Gygar. Despite the risks, Taiga approves Final Fusion again. Robot drive! Engage! Good god, could they please just install a little hinged box that flips up so this poor woman doesn't keep picking glass shards out of her hand? After a bit of a false start, he does manage to get Gao Gygar going and defeats the robot with Hell and Heaven. A combination of offensive and defensive energies that, when combined, become Gao Geigers. That's a lot of words for our sound effects budget ran out on this one. Once again, he extracts the core, though the adrenaline rush of everything has made him lose control of it. Fortunately, Mamoru arrives again to revert it back to a person, his powers even seeming to calm Guy. This leads us into episode 3, which begins with an exposition dump by the narrator about what happened when EI-01 landed on Earth absorbing various machines and then disappearing under the surface. The government then formed 3G as a defense force against potential extraterrestrial threats. But yeah, episode 3. The holy left arm. The right arm, on the other hand, knows what it did and we are very disappointed in it. The wrestler is restored, and once again, Mamoru flies off before they can question him, made worse by Guy collapsing in pain. Still, they're able to track Mamoru and intercept him outside his home, sending a bunch of soldiers after the small child, even aiming guns at him. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. In his terror, the G-mark on his head activates and Galleon leaves and quickly arrives to help him. The quick cut edits work a lot better here than in the flashing light sequences, since it more clearly shows Mamoru's panic, confusion, and fear over what's happening to him. Galleon flies back to 3G with Mamoru and lets him out, probably figuring these people are safer than the guys aiming guns. We want you to tell us all about your mysterious powers so that we may better understand you. So I'll beg you, young sorcerer. Clearly this woman is from the Texan part of Japan. Ah, dubbing and localization. Anyway, back to, hey, even I, someone who doesn't have epilepsy, cannot watch this because it hurts my eyes. With another meeting of the villains, Polonaise suggests that their next robot should be in a densely populated area, since Gao Gaigar won't dare risk fighting when there could be huge civilian casualties. Polonaise finds some random dude in a train yard riding on some kind of weird panda moped thing? Anyway, trains. Lucky train. You look so strong and powerful. Aw, oh, man. Thomas was very confused about this poor man who seemed to be hitting on him. But he was kind of curious to see where this was going. So naturally, this guy's next on the transformation block. 
Back at 3G, the wacky scientist who's been around the last couple episodes is revealed to be Guy's father, talking to that lady who keeps injuring her hand on that button who's really into Guy. She's indignant that he let Guy out on this mission, but he basically says he's just happy the dude's alive when he should have died two years ago and wants him to make his own decisions. I know that Guy can fight without fear because he has you, Makoto. Anyone who can keep doing that to their hand without incurring any lasting damage has gotta be tough enough for him. 3G contacts Mamoru's parents to let him know what's up, and they're surprisingly okay with this. I mean, they're obviously worried, but I feel like if my child was being held by the government, I'd be down wherever I could to tear the place apart until they let me be with them. They say to Mamoru that they told his parents that it's just the police questioning him about the first robot attack, but that would just make me even more inclined to go down there. Anyway, they examine Mamoru and can't find anything weird about him. His biology is completely human. EI-04, which starts off as a combination of runaway trains, launches its attack, and Guy is in no shape to fight. However, sensing what's going on, Mamoru's hair turns green again, and he heads over to Guy, a touch from him restoring him. Are you sure it's okay for you to get up, Mr. Uh... Don't call me Mr. I'm still only 20 years old, remember? Wait, does that mean that you were an astronaut at age 18? After managing to slow down EI-04 with the bullet train, EI-04 forms into another giant robot. Guy heads out and forms Gao Gai Gar, but they've entered a heavily populated area, and some minor bits of the fight cause massive damage and force people to flee. With no other choice, Taiga authorizes the launch of the Dividing Driver, which appears to be a massive flathead screwdriver that causes the land itself to split open. Damage to surrounding area! Zero! Uh, I'm pretty sure you just pushed a bunch of buildings all around the area and made a massive crater in the ground. If that doesn't qualify as damage, what the hell does? With free space to fight without collateral damage, the theme song roars in, or at least just the Gao Gai Gar repeated phrase, and it lets him cut loose and destroy it and rip out the core. They instruct him to bring the core back to base, but Mamoru says it won't work that way. And indeed, the episode ends as the thing starts to take new shape. Next episode, the narrator explains what the dividing driver actually does. That compresses and shifts a large area of land for a specified time by warping dimensional space. I don't think this works the way you think it does! Compressing stuff like that will cause it to smash and break! Not just shift around like you added a Photoshop effect! What the hell's going on for any people in those buildings? Or the pipes under them? We properly start off episode 4, The Fugitive Zonder, with the creature formed from the core just leaping away and into a pipe or something. They all just refer to it as a Zonder, so I'm assuming they know what the hell they're talking about. The compression field ends and everything returns to normal because physics are for losers who don't have giant robots. Mamoru seems to have the ability to track the Zonder, so they bring him into the area. He wanders off and he tries to be friendly towards it, offering to turn it back to normal. Zonder. I don't know guys, this new evolution for Grimer and Muck just doesn't feel different enough. He tries to restore it to normal, but it just tries to attack, forcing Guy to come in and save him. With the Zonder lost, they decide to bring Mamoru home to rest. Wait a second, you're telling me that you don't even know how you're sensing those Zonders? Right, I have no idea what a Zonder is. Wait, they've had this kid for hours and nobody thought to just ask him about this stuff until now? Mamoru asks Guy to not tell his parents about all this. Which seems like a terrible idea, but Guy says he won't and gives him a signal device to let them know if he senses a Zonder. The next day, Taiga is informed that in his day job, they're getting ready to launch a space shuttle. Oh good, if nothing crashes into this ship, maybe we can finally get the Fantastic Four. After a little character moment between Taiga and Mamoru's dad, who, Kowinki of all Kowinki Dinks, works for him. We get some discussions about how, well, they haven't found the thing yet, and some cute family moments with Mamoru and his father about what Taiga said. It's adorable. Of course, this also drops an exposition about the shuttle having the most advanced engine out there, so of course it's the target of the Zonder. Mamoru soon senses the Zonder's plans and informs Guy. 3G launches an investigation, but can't find it. Unfortunately, failing to find it also means they don't have a good reason to scrap the launch, so it proceeds. Oh, and I guess the kids are having another field trip, now to watch the launch. Quite a busy week these kids have had, from an island made of garbage to a friggin' space shuttle launch. The Zonder, of course, gets in and launches the shuttle prematurely, assimilating the craft. 
but fortunately Gaia swaps places with the astronaut. He's ejected from the shuttle and forms Gygar, sending it off course and crashing back towards the ground after releasing its fuel. After forming Gao Gygar, he forces it into the water, where they lose sight of it. He uses the dividing driver to push aside a good amount of water to find it, managing to finally smash it and grab the core. Mamoru, having run towards the battle, once again flies in and reverts the core back to the weird train guy. And so our episode ends with Mamoru figuring that these powers he has must have been given to him to protect Earth from the Zonders. Yeah, that must be it. He's gonna turn out to be a Zonder himself, isn't he? Anyway, these episodes are mostly fine and good. Not super wowed by it, but it's not a bad start. I'm probably gonna get some flack for that, especially since I don't really like the theme song and I saw so many people quoting it when I announced this episode, but it's just my honest opinion. It's pretty good, but from a story perspective, there isn't a lot so far that's really drawn me in or anything. I do really like the animation style. It's very fluid and the general aesthetics are so recognizably late 90s in terms of its color palette and design choices. All the computer user interfaces on screens at 3G's headquarters when they launch vehicles or initiate Final Fusion are just so nostalgic for me and bring me back to watching Evangelion in middle school. The mood is very fun and lighthearted for the most part. Sure, they're serious about stuff like guys' injuries or the terror of a little kid being surrounded by an army of guys with guns, but you got President Taiga going, guy will pull through because he's a hero and heroes always triumph. The good guys always win, even in the 80s. And you've got a wacky scientist who flies around on jet-boosted rollerblades, always launching into the air when Final Fusion is a success. It knows what kind of a series it is, and it keeps the mood fairly light. The pacing might feel a bit slow in parts, but not agonizingly boring or anything. It's just those moments are calm, so we're not constantly bombarded with action or the like. The characters have distinct personalities, and I like how we get flashbacks at the beginning of each episode to go into more detail about prior events or technology so we're not bogged down in exposition during an important fight. The heaven slash hell move deciding it needed a narrator over its first use notwithstanding. Speaking of, yeah, the narration is a bit distracting and unnecessary a lot of the time, coming across like it doesn't trust its audience to know what's happening. I know that exposition dialogue can be dull or nonsensical why certain characters would be saying it, but we have a viewpoint character in Mamoru that stuff could be explained to pretty easily. The dubbing is very good. Like I said, I recognize a lot of the voice actors who have shown up in this from other stuff, so they've got experienced people here giving it their all and succeeding. The big detriment to the series, as I think I have made clear, is the flashing lights. By the fourth episode, they had toned it down, but it's still recurring in the theme song and any time we cut to the villains. It's like they wanted to hide what they looked like, but instead of just having clever camera angles and shadows, they decided, hey, they can't see what they look like if they can't look at their TV. Just yeesh. The narration is superfluous and distracting, but the flashing lights make it literally unwatchable during those moments. Overall, it's a fun super robot series, very enjoyable, and I'd recommend it, especially if you know this is the kind of thing you'd be more into than me. Next time, back to comics with our annual look at Youngblood in honor of my first text review before this show started. Time for another issue of Youngblood Strike File.
Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!